All right. Thank you, Daniel. And if you got your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. And we will be moving right along. We're still in that seamless series where we're looking for Jesus in the Old Testament. And in this, we're not going to read the entire chapter because we're going to work through the whole thing. But we're going to specifically be reading uh, verses 15 through 21. And so, y'all, y'all know what we've been doing. We've been working through the Old Testament. We've been looking for Jesus in the details. We know that Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in that, we know that if Jesus is the same today and he was the same yesterday, he's going to be the same forever, then we know that Jesus had to be present in these, in these Old Testament stories that we read over and over and over. And we seem to just bypass him in most everything that we look at. And so considering that Jesus is eternally changeless, it should help us to identify him. It's almost like you're a detective, and when you know what Jesus looks like and you begin to get a good picture of him, you take your market, you take your, um, yes, magnifying glass, and you start digging in there, and then you can see him all of a sudden. I know that when he first started appearing to me in the Old Testament, it was one of the most amazing things. And tonight, as we look through this scripture, we're going to see a picture of Jesus through many different ways. We're going to see him through two different people, and then, yes, I don't want to get to my points because I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But the thing is, when we open our eyes, we're going to see Jesus in so many places that we've neglected or, or bypassed him in the past. And so let's look into the scripture tonight and see if we can find him here in Joshua chapter 2. We're going to be, again, we're going to read verses 15 through 21, but we'll be working through the whole chapter. So if you've got your place, if you would stand with me as we honor God in the reading of his word. If you don't have your place, it'll be on the screens up here. Uh, it looks like we probably uploaded this before I uh, updated it this afternoon. So if, if y'all don't have it, it's okay. Just black it out, and I'll, I'll work through it today. Yeah, cause that's, that was last week's message. All right, so here we go. We're in Joshua chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. And the scripture says, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear. Unless when you come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own hand, on his own head. And we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on your head. And I'm getting right through this. And his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your word, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you and praise you. God, thank you so much for the story of Rahab. Thank you for... What we're going to be able to learn through it tonight, and God, I pray that we find things that we wasn't even expecting. Lord, make our hearts movable. Lord, let your spirit move freely through this place. And God, I pray that we can not only grow in you tonight, Lord, that we can grow closer to you, and that we can be more usable for you and for your glory. So God, thank you for everything you're going to do. We love you and praise you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight, the, the message... We're going to be continuing to obviously find Jesus through the, through the Scripture, but the message I titled it, the harlot's hustle. And so I know that I told y'all last Wednesday, if you were here, we briefly touched on, on Rahab because she was in our scripture in James. And, and back uh, many, many years ago, I heard a message from Adrian Rogers, and he titled it The Shady Lady from Jericho. And that's what he had, t- that's what he had uh, labeled uh, Rahab. But tonight I want to talk about the harlot's hustle. I, that's the best I had. I couldn't, I want to use his name because it's so good, but harlot's hustle is where we're at. And so when we look at it from the harlot's hustle, we need to understand a little bit about where she's coming from. Rahab is really a harlot. And for those of you that may not be familiar with it, she's not doing really nice things. Uh, she, she is the, the, the chief center of women, if you want to consider it that. But in this time, she's probably doing whatever it is that she had to do to get by, or at least what she thought what she had to do to get by. And so when we look in this, we're going to find somebody that not only was usable, God, she became usable for God, but she became so usable that she landed in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews. 
And so when we start looking at Rahab and we get a picture of what God can do and who he can use, we really need to take a landscape and consider if he can do these things through this woman that was running the harlot's hustle at this very time, what can God do through you? And so obviously we're going to be looking for Jesus in the details of this story, but we need to have that perspective as we work through here. And so we're going to begin in verse 1. And the first thing I want to talk about tonight is we can see Jesus in the acts of Rahab. We can see Jesus in the acts of Rahab. And so the the point of this, and it's going to tell on what we talked about Wednesday night, is her faith brought her into action. Her faith brought her into action. Joshua 2, 1, it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went, and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And so Joshua, he sent these men out to spy this land, and it said that he did it secretly. And so that's kind of important. The the idea that he sent these men out secretly, do do y'all all remember what happened when Moses sent the men to go spy the land back in Exodus? Do y'all remember what happened? They went, they saw, and ten of them came back with a horrible story, and two of them said, let's go take it, Joshua and Caleb. But everybody else, they were in fear, they were scared. And what what happened to Israel because of what they did? They were bound into the wilderness for 40 years. That entire generation had to die because of their lack of faith. God had provided the path. They refused to go down it. And so this time, instead of making it a public spectacle and sending them all and telling everybody all about it, Joshua was secretly sent two men to go out there and spy this land. And so they went and they did. And when they came, they landed at the house of Rahab. And I find this to be really, really, really interesting. Because if you consider Rahab's profession, I guess we could call it. If you consider it, it's letting men into her house. And lo and behold, Joshua sends these two men, and where do they land? In the house of Rahab. But when you really consider how it all worked out, what better place for them to go than a place where transients are coming and going all the time? God was able to hide them out in this very place. The only key was this, what Rahab had to be offering. And so Rahab had been accustomed to taking men in, but in a totally different way. And so there's a lot that can be said about this, but what better place for two men to hide out? I've often thought that God could have found a much better place for them than this. I, you know, I, I think about that all the time. Why would God send these two guys that were out to do his work and to do his, his will, why would he send them into the house of a harlot? But I'm going to tell you something. That's a t- the thinking that I have right there and the thinking that anybody has when we do that. We become no better than Pharisees when we start thinking that way. When we start excluding somebody from being able to be used by God or that place to be used by God, I'm not saying that we need to be charging into the bar tomorrow and trying to sit down and, and be cordial with everybody in there. But my point is we don't need to be exclusive on where we'll go and what we'll do because we don't think God would use that place. God used the house of a harlot for his glory in this story. So much so that it's going to land again. This woman in the Hebrews Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame because of what he did, we need to make sure that we're not exclusive based on what we think versus what God wants to do with us. But God, here's the thing. We always need to understand God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. That's where we want to make it our way and not his. We need to always leave room for him in this. And so if we continue on into verses 2 and 3, and it says, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they come to search out all the country. And so this is somewhat of an overlooked portion that I want to talk about right here. These secret spies have been discovered and all involved, and all the people involved in this, it doesn't matter if it's the secret spies, it doesn't matter if it's Rahab, it doesn't matter if it's Jericho the king, everybody involved in this story has something to lose. Everybody. We're going to find out more about that in just a second. We're going to hear in just a few minutes that God, they already know that God has handed Jericho over to the children of Israel. If we, and we'll fast forward in verse 9, Rahab said, I know the Lord has given you the land. These people knew what was coming. So the king had his territory to lose. He had his kingdom to lose. The people of Jericho knew that they were going to be defeated. They needed to stump out what was happening. But in the children of Israel, these two spies, if they were discovered, they knew that they were going to be killed because who wants them to come take away their land? Who wants to lose? Nobody wants to lose. So we have all these things going on. So when the king sent to find them, it wasn't for pleasantries. He was looking to destroy the very threat that was sent to take his kingdom. 
He was very serious about this. And so a command went out to Rahab, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. This command was real. It was serious. They were out to take their lives. And, they were, and when Rahab makes the decisions she makes, she is more than putting her life on the line. She's putting everybody she has in her family on the line. You know, we hear these stories about these Mexican cartels and the things that they do when you, when you cross them. You lose a little bit of their drugs, what do they do? They immediately go grab one of your family members and they start threatening their lives until you pay them back. They're very serious about what they do. I'm going to tell you this right now. The king of Jericho was very serious about what was on, on the line and what was at stake. So the scene's been set. Rahab's been put into a position and a choice is going to have to be made. She's got to make a decision. Where does her, her allegiance lie? Does it lie with the people that she's been with Jericho, this kingdom she's lived in, or is it going to lie with the God of Israel? And how would she respond? And so we'll see the acts of Rahab where her, her faith truly brought her into action. Here's the thing. She believed everything that she had heard about God. She believed it. And I've read some commentary in the past about how her, her faith was shaky, how it was questionable, how it was, I, they, all kinds of different things they said about her faith. I'm going to tell you, her faith was enormous. It was immense. She trusted. She trusted without seeing. She never saw these people of Israel until these two men showed up at her house. She wasn't over there watching them defeat these people on the other side of the Jordan. She didn't see that. She heard stories, but she believed when she heard. And so when we look in verses 4 through 7, it starts to give us this picture. Then this woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. And so this is why people question her faith at times, because Rahab chose to lie right here. She could have, she could have went any direction that she wanted to. And she could have trusted in God for the answer. But here's the thing. This woman had not truly experienced God like we have. She had not experienced it. She was a harlot. She didn't even know her place. Her faith was immense. So instead of her just trusting and not, she didn't even know what it meant right now. But she told a lie and she protected the men of God. Her faith was immense. And so remember this though. When we look at it, we can still see a picture of Jesus and Rahab. I promise you're going to see it as we work through this. But the reason I bring it up is Rahab still had flesh just like us. While she's a picture of Jesus, she was not Jesus. And so when she became fearful of what was going to happen, what did she do? She went back to her old ways, and she said something she shouldn't have. She lied. God's not going to get glory in our lies and our deceit. Remember that. We need to trust him through everything. But it's still going to be an amazing story of faith. So when we talked about Rahab last Wednesday night, we, we were working through him in our series. And in James 2.25, it said, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? And so we barely scratched the surface of that. We're going to look more into all of Rahab tonight, but we're going to touch on this really fast. Rahab was justified by her works. And what was her works? She hid those men. Her faith was so big in God that it put her into action. We talked about this Wednesday night. When our, our faith without action is dead, Faith without works is dead. Rahab had faith that made her do something. So often we just sit there and we, we look around and we're waiting on somebody else to do something, for someone else to take charge, for someone else to go share the gospel over here, for someone else to fill this position that God's been waiting on you to say yes to all this time, or to go overseas and share the gospel somewhere. Whatever it is, we always wait, 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 wait. Listen, our faith puts us into action. It makes us move. And so here's the thing. We talked about this earlier, though. Rahab had everything to lose. She had everything to lose in this moment. And I said this Wednesday night, for all those who wasn't here Wednesday night, th th this is a fortified city. There's a wall all the way around Jericho. It shouldn't be overtaken. These children of Israel should not be able to just come up and have victory over here. These walls are big and they're high. But the faith that she had in the God of Israel was bigger than those walls. Just the same as the children of Israel had faith in that God, that, mar that sent them marching around the city and that had them chant one good time and the walls fell down, she had that kind of faith. And what did her faith do? It truly put her into action. Hebrews 11.31, By faith the harlot Rahab did, Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. 
And so when I talk about how great her faith is, when we look in Hebrews and we look at that Hall of Fame, that Faith Hall of Fame, how many people are in there that don't even get their own whole verse? How many of these faith giants don't even get their whole verse? Rahab got a whole verse to herself. She had some tremendous faith. She trusted God and she helped his people. And so she sacrificed herself for the love of others. And so when we start, for the lives of others, so when we start seeing that, we begin to start seeing a true picture of Jesus in Rahab. She was willing to lay her life on the line for someone else's. And what is it that Jesus says? Rarely will someone give their life for a friend or for someone else, but, but for their dear friends they will. If Jesus could do that, Rahab is in the same place as her right now. And so again, this woman that Adrian Rogers referred to as the shady lady of Jericho had faith and it gave her indescribable ability. It gave her indescribable ability, and it will give you the same too when you trust in him and when your faith is truly poured out for him. And so we begin to see this. While we can see Jesus in the acts of Rahab, you can still see her human nature. Don't forget that. She is not Jesus when we look at these people. She lied and she told untruths. But the thing is, we begin to truly see, we truly begin to see Jesus in the acts of Rahab. And so the second thing I want to talk, to not, talk about tonight, and hey, we do have it up. Good job, guys. The second thing I want to talk about tonight is the heart of Rahab. We can see Jesus in the heart of Rahab. And here's the, here's the thing. She desired for others to be able to be saved too. Her heart wasn't just considered, she wasn't just talking about herself. She wasn't self-focused. She was looking out for the lives of others. And so in the scripture, first we can see a heart of confession. She understood that God was exactly who he said he was. And that's found in verses 8 through 11. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all of the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sahan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And so when we talk about this scripture and we look into it, my goodness, what a profession of faith that is. My, what I wouldn't do when I go share the gospel with somebody to hear them tell me all of this. People don't even know the Old Testament now, so they definitely ain't going to tell you any of these things. People don't know the New Testament now, so they're not going to tell you these things. But what a confession of her faith. And so when we look at this and we want to see Jesus in this picture, what did Jesus do? Rahab confessed the Father, and I promise you this, Jesus confessed the Father also. If we look in, back in, we were in John 14 this morning just briefly, but John 14, 8, the soon-to-be apostle Philip request of Jesus, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that is sufficient for us. Think about that faith of Rahab really fast. She didn't see the Father. She just heard about him, and that was good enough. That was sufficient for her. But listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 9, and 11, 9 through 11. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. All of that being said, Jesus is confessing God as the Father. He's making the confession. So just as Rahab is making a confession, so is Jesus. And here's the thing. Every one of us have got to come to the place at some point before we leave this life to confess him as the Father. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves in judgment, and we're going to be on our knees proclaiming Jesus as Lord as, we, as we're sent to the fiery hell that's going to be awaiting us. We're all going to do it at some point. Let's do it while we're here. That's just a little side note about let's make that confession. And so Rahab confessed the Lord, and so did Jesus. But second, not only do we see a heart of confession, we see a heart of compassion. In verses 12 and 13, it says, Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And so we see that Rahab's heart was more than just for herself. She had compassion on those around her. She wanted to take as many people to the promised land, to the promises of God with her as she possibly could. She wanted to flee the place called hell that she lived in named Jericho, and she wanted to live in God's promises. 
And that is the same commission that every single one of us have. We are all commissioned to take as many people with us to heaven as we possibly can. If you're not out seeking them, if you're not out, if your heart doesn't have a heart of compassion for others around you, you're missing out on the real Jesus. I want you to know it. But Jesus is seen in Rahab. What did Jesus do? He had compassion for others. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Rahab wanted to seek and save everybody she could take with her. She had a heart of compassion. She didn't want to see anyone perish. Even though she understood that many were going to, she didn't desire for one. She wanted to take them all with her. And she made a pact to make sure that that happened. So Rahab's heart was to not see any of her others lost. And then the last thing I want to talk about in her heart is third, we see the heart of commission. She directed the men in the way that they should go. In verses 14 through 16, so the men answered her, Our lives for yours, and none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. And then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. And so when we think about that, Rahab has given them very clear direction. She's commissioning them on the path that they are to take. She's not, she's saying, she ain't giving any leeway. She's saying, this is exactly what you do. This is how you do it. She's preparing them, and she's sending them out so that they can go back and be right where they belong. And just as she's giving them direction and command, Jesus does the same. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus commanded, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Very clear direction coming from Jesus. Very clear direction coming from Rahab. And the more that we look at it and then to her heart, the more we see the heart of Jesus directly reflected in her. We begin to see a true picture of Jesus in this moment. And so Jesus gave us clear direction in all that we're to do and all that we're to go. And Rahab commissioned these spies and provided the men very clear direction. Not only did, it, did she give them direction, she gave them the means to be safe. She gave them the means of, of exactly how to walk. And God is doing the same for us in all that we do. He's preparing our paths. He's commissioning us. He's commanding us. And the, goodness gracious, Jesus is all in every bit of this. And so the last thing I want to talk about tonight, and I know I've really run through these first two points, but the last one's the one that really sticks with me. It's the one I want us to really focus on. And so I've talked about, I've talked about the heart, and I've talked about the actions, but tonight I want to talk about the court of Rahab. And I think that, yes, we'll get to it in a second, but the scarlet cord, it was destroyed. It was destroyed. It's going to be destroyed as we work through this passage. But it gave her her identity. And so verses 17 through 24, I'm going to read through them again because I want to get this full picture. And so the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which we have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your home, so it shall be whoever goes outside the doors of your house into this street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on your head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we'll be free from our oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And they bound the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went out by the mountain. And they stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers sought them all along the way, but did not find them. So the two men returned, descended from the mountain, and crossed over. And they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered us all the land into our hands. For indeed, all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. And so when I've read through this, I've not really talked about Joshua much tonight. But when I've read through this scripture... Joshua is an incredible picture of Jesus. He gives us many different looks at Jesus. You think about it in particular. He was sent, he was sent to be the Savior. He ended up being the Savior of Rahab in this story. We find that. He's in charge. He makes provision. He makes sure that Rahab is saved. He came to seek and save that which was lost. But at the same time, Joshua also came to pronounce judgment on the people of Jericho. And so when we think about Jesus, what does he do? He came to seek and save the lost, but he also came so that he would be able to pronounce judgment in the time when time came. 
And so we can see the picture of that. And that, that I've always kind of went there. So remember, always remember this. You know, it's kind of hard to think about these people of Jericho and understand this. But they knew, they knew the story of God. Rahab, Rahab proclaimed it herself. They knew the story of God. So judgment was going to come to them because they turned away from God. Every one of them had the opportunity to open their doors and let the children of Israel in. But they refused him and rejected him. And so we see Jesus and Joshua. But many times... I've also looked at this story, and I've been sharing it with you already. We can look at Rahab, and we can see Jesus in Rahab. You know, you think about this. There's so many points inside this where we can find identity. We can find Jesus' traits and identity in her. And Jesus can be seen through him. So while I named this message, The Harlot's Hustle, I really probably should have named it The Cord That Binds. And the reason being is this, because the scarlet cord is the most perfect picture of Jesus in this entire story that you're going to find. But first, I want to talk about how we see it, how it, how it gives us the identity of the blood of Jesus, first and foremost. Back in verses 17 through 19, it said, So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when you come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And then she went on to, he went on to say, All of the people that you want to bring with you. So the thing is, the blood, the blood, they were gonna, the blood was going to be on her hands without this cord. But with this scarlet cord, things completely changed. There was absolutely no salvation for her or her family without that scarlet cord. Unless it was hung, there was no salvation. It had to be there. Matter of fact, it was clearly stated that the blood would be on her own head had she not hung it there. So when we start talking about this, when we get saved, what happens to us? The blood of Jesus covers us, it coats us. We've been given a new life, a new heart, and a new way. We have a responsibility for those around us just as she did through the blood of Jesus. We have that. And I don't want to get way over there on this. I want to kind of stay on the, on the point. But the point is this. That scarlet cord represented Jesus' blood. And with it hanging there, it gave, her, it gave her the pass to be removed from the land, to be taken to safety, and to be ushered into the, land, into the children of, uh, of Israel, to the children of God. And so without that scarlet cord, there was absolutely nothing. But here's the thing. But that cord was not just representative of Jesus' blood. It also represented his entire body. If you look in, jo in Joshua 6, 21, it says, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. And I'm, I jumped way ahead. I'm now in Joshua chapter 6. But all the way over in jo Joshua chapter 6 and verse 21, we find out when, when Israel goes and they begin to march around the city and then the walls fall and they go in there to take it, we find out they utterly destroyed all that was in the city of Jericho. They utterly destroyed it all. And so while the scarlet cord has been bound up there, I'm going to read through the rest of the scripture and I'll get there. Both man and woman, it says, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. And listen to this, but they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua was spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers from whom Joshua was sent to spy out Jericho. And so here's the thing. Not only does it say, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, they also, but they burned the city and all that was within it with fire. And so Jesus is fully seen in this scarlet cord because it fully embodies him. That scarlet cord fully embodies him. That scarlet cord was left and became the sacrifice for the lives of Rahab and her family. They didn't go take it down. It was tied up there and it was left up there. So when the city fell, when it was destroyed and when it was burned, it was removed forever. It's, it was given for her and for her family. They had life. They had life because of that cord. They had life because of that cord. And we have life today because of Jesus. Jesus is truly, his full body is represented in that cord. And so there's so many points to this, but here's the thing that I really want us to understand. If God can use a man named Joshua as a picture of Jesus, what can he do with you? It's not just a man. Joshua is an old, old, old man now. What can he do with you if he can use Joshua? Let me, let me take it a step further. If God can take a harlot named Rahab 
in a place of absolutely no hope where she's excluded from the children of Israel and he can use her in amazing ways, what can he do with you? What can he do with you? But even bigger and better than that, if God can take a scarlet cord and hang it in a window and let it dangle and he can save lives through that, what in the world can he do with you? He is a limitless God. He is a limitless God. And so while it's wonderful, listen, I'm, I'm excited that we can find Jesus in the details of the Old Testament. I, I, I was so close to not doing any more of these and going to something different this week. But the more that I looked at it Wednesday for the message, the more I said, we've got to get into this because we need to stop putting limits on God and we need to start being used by God for his good and his glory. God can take a cord and, and save people's lives. They're not even in, this cord wasn't even indwelled with the Holy Spirit, much less the others that I'm talking about. They weren't indwelled with the Holy Spirit. You have the living God living inside of you. What can he do with you? God has such a plan for us. We've got so many things in front of us that we've never even began to experience. I'm going to tell you right now, we could walk out of this church and just start walking down the road. Somebody could go down Old Field Road. Somebody could go down Angel Drive over here. I don't get confused on all these others. Clark and all these other roads that are all around here. We can start walking down them, and I'm going to tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find people that are looking for that scarlet cord to be tied to their window so that they can find some hope in life today. People are dying for the gospel. They want it so bad. I'm going to share this with you. Sunday night, Sunday afternoon last week, we went on outreach. And we've got, I got to meet with a young lady. She's been bringing her daughter to church here on Wednesday nights for I don't know how long, since before I was here. And we got to share the gospel with her. And y'all know what happened. She gave her life to Jesus. She gave her life to Jesus. God is still using us, all of us, when we're willing to go. Maybe we need to be a little bit more like this scarlet cord and not have any choice in the matter. And just let God do what he wants with us. That cord didn't ask to be tied in that window. That cord didn't ask to be destroyed with the city. That cord didn't ask to be burned up with fire. But you know what? God used that cord. Let's just be in surrender and say, God, use me for whatever it is you want to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you. God, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, it is wonderful. It is so wonderful to be able to see Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But God, I can't say this enough. If we don't come to the place where we take application and then we actually live out what you're teaching us, it doesn't matter how much we know. So tonight, when we have this mature group of believers in this room, we've been listening to your word, we've been talking about your word, and God, we've been talking about the things that you've done through other people. It's time that we look to you and say, why not me? Why not me, God? What do you want to do with me? Just use me. Use me for your purpose and for your glory. God, have your way with me. God, send me out for your will. And Lord, I know that you've got a very special plan. So God, just do it. Make me movable, make me usable, and be glorified. And so, so Father, we love you, we praise you. And God, I don't know what all you want to do with this, but just let us be in surrender. So Father, I thank you and love you and praise you and ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. And so as we get ready to, to move into a time of invitation, here's what I ask. Are you usable tonight? Can God do with you what he wants? Because here's the thing. If you have just this much faith, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. God took a woman that had absolutely no business being used in his story and made it she made her way all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and she's still being preached today. If he can do that there, what can he do right here? Let's stop limiting God, and let's let him have his way. So in this time of invitation, if you'll stand with me, if Jesus Christ, if you do not know him as your Lord and Savior, please surrender to him tonight and say, God, just save me. I would love nothing more than to lead you to him. Come and ask me, grab me by the hand, and I'd love to talk to you about Jesus. But if you have him, are you usable? Can he do with you as he pleases? If not, surrender it all and just say, send me, Lord. Just send me. If you need to lay something down at the altar, 
Here's your time. Just come. Just come.